welcome again. I've been given the mic for the second time today, so I'm going to keep it short. Youth activism, it's a topic that makes me feel both comfortable and uncomfortable. The activism part of it I'm actually very comfortable with after four years of being a climate activist on the front line trying to sound the alarm about the climate and nature crisis. I feel sure that history will look back fondly and kindly to those that were brave enough to step forward to defend our incredible planet. That we will be looked back at as the ones that actually acted appropriately to the scale of the threat that we face. I feel uncomfortable because it is a youth session and that it is a, such a shame that our young people are the ones that are having to act like adults in this situation, to say, speak the uncomfortable truths and to put their bodies on the line, to risk their liberties before their lives have even really begun. And we all know about what lies ahead and how we're going to have to be here to support our young people. It was in the paper yesterday that a quarter of youths in this country are seeking help for eco-anxiety. And that anxiety is not caused by the climate crisis. I've given talks across lots of schools called Eco-Anxiety to Empowerment, and the kids are so excited about getting involved in the solutions. Like, what we need to do to address this problem, these cascading, you know, this mess of problems that we have, are all interlinked, are all really simple, that young children can explain to global leaders what it is that we need to do far more eloquently, and they're really passionate about making these things happen. And we need to empower our youth to lead on everything possible so that they feel that empowerment and they feel that they're being heard and that they're making a difference. So I'm not gonna steal the stage for very much longer. I'm gonna hand over to our first speaker tonight, Olivia Bandage. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon all. Uh, my name is Liv Bowditch. I'm 17 and I'm a student representative from SAST. More specifically, the fabulous Griffin School in Sherbourne. And I'm honoured to be here today. The turnout has been incredible. Today we're here to talk about youth activism. So before we start, I'd like to do a little plug uh, for a youth engagement event that I'm in the process of arranging with two amazing teachers, uh, the Griffin COP28. So, what is COP28 at the Griffin? Well, we have 17 schools across our trust, a mixture of primary, secondary, including sixth form, to send delegates to a mini UN-style conference that mirrors the COP28. Uh, each will get a country fact file beforehand uh, so they can learn about the various climate-related issues that they need to navigate. These include oceans, forests and food, energy and cities. Not only will it encourage students to learn about the issues that each country and the world faces, but it will teach the importance of diplomacy. In a polarised world, we need the future generation to work together. Am I right? Um. <laughs> so, we're also lucky enough to have speakers from Greenpeace, the chair of the Young People's Trust for the Environment, Peter Littlewood, uh, Lola's Cupcakes, uh, MD Asha Budwig, uh, the Eden Project's Portland CEO, Seb Brook, and Jennifer Morissetti for, of Fashion Dorset. Um, it doesn't end there, and let me tell you why. I recently read Donut Economics by circular economist hero Kate Way Rayworth, and she talks about anchoring. As an A-level economics student, I can tell you that sustainable economics isn't really looked at. Yet, we need a generation of economic students who think sustainably and problem solve. My logic was that with our COP, if we educate and discuss, show students that, dis that sustainable companies can succeed and thrive, then have sustainable careers and skills, have a sustainable careers and skills fair, we can show students that a greener model can work. After all, if companies want to be sustainable, they will need workers with the right skill sets and we'll need consumers with the right mindset. So, I want to connect 1,500 students with both local and national businesses from our Green Careers Fair, as well as universities who will showcase their degrees that they can lead to sustainable careers, such as green engineering, or material development, or economics, or law, or the food industry, or architecture. 
Uh, more than anything, I'm keen for businesses and organisations to promote their green, green credentials and services to students. This also includes promoting repairing items, as opposed to just filling the landfill, promoting green products lines for businesses and encouraging people to shop local. If you're interested in getting involved, please do get in touch, even if it's to share some interested contacts. We'd love for you to have a stand so that students can talk to you about your field, uh, or you can promote your products. Uh, Sherbourne, ha Sherbourne has such a vibrant community who are passionate and about our adapting our very old town to meet the net zero targets. So please do come and find me if you would like to find out more. How was that? Was that a good sales pitch? <laughs> Um, so before we meet, um, we hear from Alex Moore, who's our keynote speaker, um, who sadly cannot be with us today. I do have a little preamble that he would like us to share, with you, which he would like me to share with you before he watches, you watch his video. So, outside of the classroom, climate upheaval and digitalisation are rupturing the fabric of reality and indeed society, challenging us to think differently and evolve our practices. In contrast, our education systems remain in a state of arrested development, glacial and slow to adapt. This talk is about the future of education in a fast-changing, post-humanist world, the Anthropocene. In the dangerous and threatening world of the bestowed on them as custodians of this imagined future. In the videos that follow, I invite the reader on a voyage of discovery, one poised at the intersection of social justice, the nexus of climate change and the promise of digital automization. Here, I hope to share a wider vision of a potential future that will require every bit as much human courage and enterprise to survive. Uh, there are a couple of points for pause and reflection. If you would like to get involved with the work we're doing um, with our SAST schools, please do speak to one of the representatives or alternatively, there are contact details at the end of the video. Hi there, my name is Alex Moore. I'm assistant head teacher at Shaftesbury School and I work for a family of schools called SAST, which as a crow flies is about 20 miles north of where you're sat today. I'm really sorry I can't be there today in person, but hopefully this collection of three short videos will paint a picture for how education is in the Anthropocene. The two main themes are hope and legacy, but I'm going to break it down into three short segments. First of all, I'm going to talk about the slow violence of climate change. Then we're going to follow that with some work around legacy in terms of what we can leave our young people to grapple with in this changing world. And lastly, I'm going to share some experiences from our SAS schools that we're trying to make a difference, creating courageous advocacy in our young people to speak out against the things that they're really passionate about. I want to explore the horizons of ideas linked with the practices of education, something we can all relate to because we've all been through it. In the dangerous and threatening world of the Anthropocene, our young people face total uncertainty. This is a cherished burden bestowed on them as custodians of this imagined future. Poised at the intersection of social justice, the nexus of climate change and the promise of digital automation, our young people stand very, very precariously. To well below two degrees Celsius and to pursue 1.5 degrees to safeguard future living conditions. Since then, a lot has happened. But the action needed is still nowhere in sight. The gap between what we need to do and what is actually being done is widening by the minute. We are still speeding in the wrong direction. The five years following the Paris Agreement have been the five hottest years ever recorded. And during that time, the world has also emitted 
more than 200 gigatons of CO2. I'm trying to teach our children a different story, one that evolves around them in terms of what they can do in their everyday lives and speak out against some of the issues that are affecting their futures. And that also involves you. Stick around to the third and final video to find out how you can get involved in some of the work locally that we're doing to try and enhance climate literacy across our schools. A useful starting point is to imagine what change might look like in five, 10, 20 years. Thinking in decades can be a really useful practice and I often engage the young people that I teach in this. They have to write a letter to their future selves and explain what things might look like in the future. It's an act of hope, but it's also an act of getting them to have some agency in that future. Hearing children explain themselves to the world is a fascinating thing. Now, one of the things that surfaces constantly from this exercise is deep worry about the future. They're anxious, they have climate anxiety, and they're worried about what might come. Now, climate literacy as a concept only really exists in the far-flung corners of schools, as I've said already, in the domains of sort of uh, geography and science. Aside from tokenistic gestures and at times greenwashing, education can be guilty of turning a blind eye. By climate literacy, I mean the language that children need to know, need to speak. Think wet bulb, net zero, carbon sequestering for starters. Beyond this, our curriculums need to lay the, ground, the grounds for the cultural acceptance that will have to follow when borders collapse to bring the world closer. Some will even disappear underwater like sunken empires. Navigating this future will require agile minds and acute problem solving skills. We must position our children with new knowledge, a toolkit for surviving what awaits. I'd like you just to turn to the people either side of you and have a talk about being hopeful. What does the future of education look like in your mind? How does climate literacy sit at the heart of that? So children are learning some of the key terms they need to know in order to be able to survive the future and not just survive the future. We don't just want to survive it. We want our children to thrive in it and make it their own and have a legacy of a world that they're proud to have and is sustainable going forward for future, future generations. Hi, welcome back. I hope that was useful. and You got to have a conversation with the people either side of you. These opportunities and events are a great showcase to kind of share ideas and talk about some of the sort of prevalent issues that we face both in schools, but also in our communities. So I'm really interested kind of to hear what you thought about your hopes and what you thought about your fears. And I thought I'd share a couple of the hopes and fears from the students' perspectives. One of the things I do uh, alongside my teaching is um, I'm doing a PhD. Um, I kind of study around uh, sustainability, automation, but also social injustice. So quite a kind of nexus of different ideas. And I often ask the children in my care about what they're hopeful about in, in the future. One of the things that they talk about is more equality in terms of access to resources globally. Another thing they talk about quite often is understanding more about the impact of climate change and some of the rhetoric and language that kind of surrounds that. And that's a curriculum issue. I think in terms of how we go forward with that, we need to change some of the language, the climate literacy that surrounds the content in our curriculum. At the moment in the UK, climate change, particularly at a secondary level where GCSEs and A-levels are studied, only really lives in the confines of geography and science. It doesn't really live anywhere else. Of course, there are the practitioners, there are teachers who are really passionate about it and they might drive it through eco clubs or ideas. But on the whole, it's kind of neglected a little bit. And we, we live in quite a knowledge rich curriculum uh, era where exams are taken and they act as academic currencies to the next steps. And I think what we need to see, certainly at a political level in the next few years, is a change for climate literacy to come to the forefront. In maths, there's nothing stopping students learning about calculations around carbon emissions, kilograms of carbon for flights, for foods, for emissions. That would be a fantastic addition to the maths curriculum. Media and language is a great, great way to express ideas. I'd like to see carbon related texts being studied within the discourses and the language kind of skills within those subjects. Science is fantastic for teaching climate change, as is geography, but we shouldn't treat them as separate subjects. Yes, the children sit different exams in them, but there's potential to join the ideas up and work across subjects in something that's called an interdisciplinary way. Now, there's a new university in London called LIS, the London Interdisciplinary School, and they are really pioneering this new approach. Rather than going to study sociology or geography or a subject discipline, you study complex problems of which climate change is one, 
and then research methods on how to tackle those complex problems. So this is really pioneering. It's got me thinking in the classroom how I might extract some of those ideas and put them into practice here. Now, obviously, as a teacher in the UK secondary setting, I'm confined by um, the curriculum and I'm confined by the exams that kind of govern the outcomes from those curriculums. But there's scope to be quite creative. And some of the ideas I'm going to share in the next chapter kind of talk about some of the things we're already doing in this domain through the STEAM, science, technology, engineering, art and maths, but also just through some collaboration with some fantastic organisations and companies who put sustainability at the front, the forefront of their thinking in the world right now if we don't stop the earth from getting that much hotter we're kind of screwed and we're already at 1.1 degrees but who's meant to be stopping it why is there so much jargon everywhere and how can you make a difference in this this final video brings together the other two videos it's been a story about hope hope for our young children hope for the future but it's also been a story of legacy what we can leave behind in terms of memories experiences and motivations so they'll be sort of empowered to take the next steps i'm going to share with you now some fantastic things that we've been doing within our sas schools now this acts as a blueprint to what's possible when you sort of open your mind to new ideas and you, you use the world as your classroom beyond the sort of immediate walls of the physicality of the building you invite the outside world in whether that be industry agriculture or you know people with other countries and other settings Classroom and teaching become so much more powerful when you open the doors to these sort of opportunities for our young people. So we're going to share some stuff that we've done within the SAS schools, primary and secondary, and how we're kind of on our journey to make our young people courageous advocates for some of the things that I've spoken about in, in, in these videos. Before the lesson began, I was a bit nervous, scared because I'm so familiar with the cord, uh, coding and all this technology. But now I feel really believed that I can achieve something that I've never done before, and it's a good feeling. I liked the session because it was really fun making our little robot car. And how do you feel now? Lovely, but also kind of sad because I don't want to do anything else besides this. Not that you guys are running to the finish line. Yeah, I'm going to finish line. Now that you guys are going to pass the finish line. It was a, a fantastic morning. Um, all the students really enjoyed using the, the kits. Um, they got to really experiment and uh, kind of explore how each of the modules worked and eventually came up with a project that was uh, absolutely outstanding. It really allowed them to engage with how technology works, how the environment works, and did some really um, quite unique uh, cross curricular kind of studies. With it. Food science has been really great. We've had lots of students in here today learning about coding and about robotics. One of the things I love about it is the sustainability focus. These two students are facing a fairly uncertain future in terms of climate change, and some of the challenges they face around electric cars, automation, things like solar farms. And to be able to kind of bring that um, sort of environmental focus into coding is really rare. And Food Science does that in a fantastic and inclusive way, and our students have enjoyed it nicely today. On climate change, the 9 to 14 year old pupils from across the area yesterday. The session, arranged in collaboration with Planet Shaftesbury, aimed to inform students about the challenges ahead and share ideas and best practice so the pupils could spread the message about the climate emergency within their friends and family groups. I spoke with four of the Year 9 students who enjoyed listening to the 10 guest experts, each speaking about their specific areas of knowledge. Robin Walters discussed tree planting in his workshop. Innes of Alos of the University of Bath talked about rewilding and bees. Finlo Costain spoke about food security. And Planet Shaftesbury and Extinction Rebellion member Richard Eccleston discussed climate action. Student Annie attended one of the sessions. She said pupils were divided into groups and each one had to come up with solutions for a different aspect of the climate emergency. Different ideas for how you can sort of, you know, deal with it and hopefully get rid of it. The teacher that was doing it said that because it's our future, we should be able to decide what you do. So he just sort of let us say what we thought. But I mean, it's all about learning things, this, isn't it? And perhaps challenging preconceptions. There was a guy who said you could grow meat and fat. Like a plant, just not a plant. <laughs> it's still really confusing. 
climate change is an issue that really does need to be tackled and there are many different ways about or going about that but i think that there's no point in saying that as an individual just because other people aren't doing it you shouldn't because if you start doing it maybe other people will as well really really good people because they like trying to save the planet i suppose it's fun to chat with them Thank you for listening today and engaging with some of the tasks that I set you. We've got some of our students there today representing SAS School. So we've got Liv on the panel. Liv did a TED talk and it's a fantastic advocate for kind of what our young people are doing in our schools. And you've also heard from Henrietta Love, who's a Griffin student in front of the SAS schools talking about kind of young farmers. And she was also one of our TEDx speakers. So really appreciate you listening to this. Um, I'm really sorry again, I couldn't be there in person and it's a wonderful event. I hope it's gone well. No doubt it's, it's baking hot. It's always the way when we return to school, the sunshine comes out. And I've put at the bottom here a couple of links to follow up. Uh, we've got a sub stack. We've got some uh, social profiles that you can follow up and kind of learn more about the work we do here and kind of the story behind what it is we're doing. So thanks very much. Have a great day. And yeah. A round of applause for Alex. <laughs> and next up, Today, we'd like to invite the presentation from the Damers School. Who'd like to come up first? Hello, everybody. Um, my name's Ed Moore. Um, I lead the eco work here at Damers First School. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about uh, the Harmy pro project that um, we've embedded within our, in, within our curriculum over the last five years. Um, it is an approach uh, where um, our children learn about nature, but we also uh, learn from nature, which is really important. So uh, the Harmony Project was uh, founded by King Charles. It's based on a book called uh, A New Way of Looking at Our World. And it's uh, led by a former head teacher called uh, Richard Dunn. Um, and uh, it's based on uh, seven principles, uh, as you can see on the screen. Uh, I won't read them all. Um, and in, in the corner there, you can see that's our, that's our lovely school garden with our um, recycled plastic bottle greenhouse that we made oh, about eight years ago, and it's still going strong now. So uh, the Harmony Project is all about inquiries of learning, um, and it's really important that I think we get uh, children to question um, about our environment, um, uh, uh, um, and uh, which then generates lots of research, um, lots of questioning. They learn lots of great knowledge, um, and they, um, they explain lots of knowledge, uh, and they're more. Uh, they more they learn more about like, their sustainable future, um, and it really impacts on. Um, their learning, but also um, they can go back then into their community, into their parents and start lobbling with them about what is really passionate to them. Uh, so this is how we, how we form our curriculum. Uh, so it starts from an inquiry question. Um, so for example, we've got uh, how can we make sure our oceans stay amazing? Um, and then we you choose a, a principle to go with that, and then you choose one of the topics, the eco school topics, because um, we all go for the flag each year. Um, uh, so it goes really well with marine, but you know, the other topics are like uh, transport, um, waste, litter, school grounds, and then you're ticking the box. You don't have to do an eco club. You're doing it within your school curriculum. Every child is getting involved. Everybody's making a making a difference um, and you, you know, you're ticking the box for the eco schools green flag, which lots of schools do, you know, 20,000 schools are a part of the eco schools uh, program, which is fantastic. And um, so the, the whole inquiry question goes down um, through every subject, like a golden thread, um, and it's all in, incorporated 
in every single subject that we do, which is fantastic. Um, and we get lots of people from outside, so ocean generation, surf against sewage, marine um, conservation, kids against plastic, Amy and Ella Meek, they're awesome. If you don't know about them, they're, they're, they're really good, really supportive of what we do and what schools want to do. Um, and Ocean Generation was founded by uh, Joe Ruxton, uh, who was the producer of the uh, Blue Planet uh, One. And uh, she's really cool. She's always wanted to come into schools and, and you know, tell uh, children about, you know, how important it is to look after our oceans. Um, but, and another great one that we've done was um, why should we look after the natural wonders of our world? Um, and uh, children wrote letters uh, to the Wildlife Trust and they said, well, you know, why don't we have um, five natural wonders of Dorset? Hey, how cool would that be? Um, but, so we had five natural ones of Dorset. We put these on the map, um, encourage tourists to come visit them, but also get them to look after the look after these natural wonders you know we've all seen in the news in the past years about Durdle Door and the litter problems there um, and if we could put these um, you know if we can put these um, natural wonders of Dorset on the map then you know one it brings in tourists two it brings in money but also we're putting it on the map so then they could be looked after uh, by everybody and, and enjoyed by everyone and how cool it would be if we could have natural wonders of Devon and Cornwall and, and every county across the UK um, and what it also did with this great project was that it encouraged children to go out into Dorset and look at um, these these natural wonders with their with their parents, um, and, and you know, and they're right on their doorstep. Um, so we did some um, natural art with uh, Gina Marshall, who's a local artist, looking at patterns, and uh, this is this is the door, um, and then. They want, you know, children wanted to find out more themselves, their own learning, um, you know, about turtles, about the effects of plastic on turtles, uh, finding out facts about our oceans as well. And then the Harmony Project, you know, it brings so much benefit, so, so more benefits. Um, you know, children are more determined. Uh, they want to make an impact on their on their world, they want to go out and they, they feel inspired, they go and lobby businesses and, and the local community. Um, their knowledge is unbelievable. Uh, you know, they want to go, you know, they go into their homes and they want their parents to get on scooters and bikes and they want, you know, to reduce single use plastic. They want their they want to grow um, things in their garden or pots or even have an allotment so then you know they're reducing the air miles of like food um, you know they're, the, they're like developing skills that they'll need uh, for you know their adulthood which is so important um, and it's really important as well that you know that um, there's something called the nature premium so the nature premium is um, a trial at the moment um, and the idea is that schools will get about £5,000 to uh, help children out into nature and the Harmony Project are, are, are a part of that and we trialled it, um, we trialled a, a campaign uh, this year um, which was nature journaling which we're still evolving um, but there are you know, there are schools uh, doing that as well. And there is now a Dorset Harmony Hub. So as well as Damers, um, we've been doing Harmony for the last five years. We've got St Abbas, we've got Melbourne St Andrews, um, we've got Poodle Valley as well, to name a few. Um, and there are 10 in that Dorset Hub. And I'll pass over to my, the stars of the show at Damers, to uh, <laughs> Emma. Get to Pound Route. 
We wrote a letter to Jason Bowman, manager at Dutchie, who supported our campaign. We also wrote letters to Chris Peck, who at first dismissed the idea. We wrote back to Chris, he agreed to a meeting during May half term. Proposed or tested to can be root ideas. It could take five to ten years to complete depending on funding when it becomes available. Dorchester War Memorial to Dorchester West Station Bridge will be the first phase. Phase 2 from Bridge to Damage First School, then Phase 3 to Monkey Jump Roundabouts. Energy Sparks is an online energy analysis tool and energy education programme. We have worked closely with Mr Kinsar Caretaker to turn down the thermostat, turn everything off during school holidays. This has reduced our energy consumption by 12% plus each month. We are Energy Sparks Regional and National Champions. Schools score points by recording their activities. Over 1,000 primary and secondary schools around the country took part. We won £1,250 to go towards an energy saving improvement or sustainability project within the school. We designed the poster with Wallace Agency to make sure everything is turned off at the end of the day. The money saved goes into a pot where classes can put in a proposal for some of the money to put towards a workshop, school trip or equipment if they are powered down correctly. DfE Energy Efficiency Funding The DfE has given all schools across England funding to improve energy efficiency. We have spent our money on our lights, our LED, endotherm. A special chemical has been added to our boiler system, reducing energy consumption by 20%. Measurable energy super sockets. This allows sockets to automatically identify devices plugged in. The sockets use a light to indicate if the energy is coming from the solar, green, or the grid, red. 40 new solar panels will be added to the existing 40 panels in the courtyard playground. Work will start in October half term. Raising funds for the Echo Point. Echo Point plays a sound stage which helps adults and children to enter a state of calm in times of crisis. Echo Point impact. Lower stress, lower blood pressure, improved mood controls breathing. Bench or pose. All your experience accesses by a button. No means power required, environmentally friendly. By scanning the QR code, our staff, children and parents can experience a sound tape and guided breathing any time of the day. This permission can then be shared across our community if we can raise the money for it. Thank you for listening. Standing ovation, come on. Wow, kids leading the way. <laughs> Thank you so, so much for having the bravery to come here today and to share all the great ideas and concepts that you are making happen. I think all of us adults in the room need to download this QR code for this calming effect that, yes, we do all need. And to help with the fundraising by the sounds of things. You know, how sad is that, that five to 10 years it will take to get the funding together to get one cycle route? I know a group of people in this room who might have made a cycle route pattern overnight with very little funding. <laughs> Such is the power of direct action. Thank you. Brilliant. So next up, we are changing tracks, still amongst the young, 
but we're heading to Young Farmers. Can I please invite Henrietta Love up to the stage? Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Henrietta Love. I'm 19 years old, and I've just finished my career with the SAST schools at the Griffin in Sherbourne. And I'm off two weeks tomorrow to start my university degree in rural environment and land management. Now, I'm here on behalf of young farmers. When I say that, that might unsettle you slightly for two reasons. Well, young farmers, they're known for their drinking and their antisocial behaviour and all these carnage we see caused on the roads at harvest time. But I'd like to assure you that that's not what we're all about. That's a small, tiny percentage that just seems to ruin the point of young farmers for everyone else. But there's also a deeper, darker connotation when I talk about young farmers. I'm at a climate conference and I'm talking about farming. Now, it's interesting, isn't it? Quite often, young uh, farmers in particular, we get the blame. Um, our farming practices, I will admit, in many cases are outdated. And compared to the rest of Europe, we really aren't that well up on being organic, being sustainable, being regenerative. And I'll be the first one to hold my hands up and say that. I began my youth activism journey, if you'd like to call that, only recently. I was invited to go to Austria to be part of the Rural Youth Europe um, annual rally in Klagenfurt, Austria. The whole point of the rally is to talk about the issues that matter most to people in the rural areas. Now, that's not just in England, Wales, Scotland. That's far-reaching across all of Europe. We had delegates from Slovenia, from Germany, from as far away as Latvia. And the one thing we could all agree on to host our rally about this year was the thought of climate change, and more, more especially, our theme was eat, grow, repeat. We were talking about the circular economy of food, something that as young farmers from across the, across the continent, we could all agree we can all improve on. We had sessions on a range of different topics, talking about not only how we grow the food and, and the processes we use, but the different types of foods that we grow, the different types of crops that we plant. In, in the UK, we plant a lot of um, turnips and a lot of swedes, and these are really good to put nitrogen back into the soil. But across the continent, they don't do so much of that. They plant more maize, which is a lot more labour intensive and can be a lot more, uh, need a lot more fertiliser. We had um, sessions from the Austrian Minister of Agriculture. She came and did a fantastic talk about their new schemes um, introducing more organic farming and also organic farming to a higher level than what we do in the UK at the moment. I was really shocked to learn in Austria 85% of farms are organic. Now if you compare that to the UK where it's only about 25-30%, we're falling miles behind. So I had a fantastic time on this trip and it was incredible to, to learn that we aren't alone as we face this climate battle. It's not just England, it's not just Wales. We aren't the only ones where farming is blamed for the majority of the problems. And we also spoke about why, why as farmers we blamed. And I think there's a massive difference between the youth, the young farmers, because everyone I was on that trip with, we all understood the problem. We knew we needed to become organic. We knew we needed to use more electric um, cars and, and start investing in electric equipment like tractors. But it's that older generation where the problems lie, and it's often those people who have the control over the farms and the machinery we can use. And also at a government level, there is so much funding out there for green um, farming, for rewilding, for um, better efficient equipment. But we can't access it, not just because we aren't educated enough to fill out these long, complex forms and go to these long, complex meetings, but also because that's just not sustainable for how our farms run. You know, it's all very well, it's very lovely to have a farm where 50% of it is rewilded for flowers and for the bees. But this just cannot be sustainable on a working farm in the UK at the moment. And so maybe more needs to be done at a governmental level to make this accessible for your everyday farmer on the ground, not just your everyday um, London banker who's bought 50 acres in Dorset. So alongside that, Young Farmers, um, we've, we've made lots of promo videos from our time in Austria because it was fantastic to meet with so many other people. And we're now looking at more national schemes. Uh, we're looking at a national tree planting scheme for different clubs across the, county, across the country. 
and, and other national topics will now start to include more about being more sustainable and regenerative. So that's what I've done or started to do. Um, but what can you do? You know, we talk about youth activism, but actually we need the help of our parents sometimes. Some, we need the help of those older generations. And so it's things like always choosing organic. You know, it's just such an easy choice and I know it can be more expensive, but what's the cost really in your child's future or an extra 20p in your bit of milk? Um, I know it's not really the right climate for saying that with this whole cost of living crisis, but it's unfortunate. And until the government do something to reduce the cost of such things, it's the cost we have to face. So it's choosing the right products when you go shopping, choosing organic, always trying to back British, because even if it's cheaper coming from somewhere else, the food standards here are phenomenally higher than anything that's imported from New Zealand or Australia or anywhere on the continent. So it's things like that. And the other thing is, when you talk about young farmers and when you talk about farmers, please don't paint us all with the same brush. <laughs> Thank you. Brilliant. It's so inspiring to hear young people that are leading the way in such important areas. And I wonder if that's our big hope. What came to my mind was a what if question. What if we actually handed the reins over to the young people now and let them fix the problem and lead us and tell us what we should be doing? I think we'd be in a much better place. <laughs> So I'm obviously not a youth, but I was asked to come and be a part of this panel because I have done activism and I am local. Um, I went along to a local Heading for Extinction talk and I learned about the history of civil resistance, nonviolent direct action, and how that had been so influential in forcing societal change when it was reluctant through history. As an athlete, I'm trained to kind of look at the shortest route to achieve my goals. And when I looked at the fact that we've been signing petitions, going on marches, you know, making these incremental step changes for so long now, and nothing had changed. In fact, emissions were still going up. I was like, okay, I'm in. And slowly just gained my confidence with it um, to the extent that three days before COP, I was aboard the pink boat blocking an oil refinery to draw attention to the, d the immediate demands that were the same that International Energy Agency and the United Nations were trying to communicate. But through the imagery of this action, we were able to communicate that there must be no new oil f licenses, subsidies or investments from now. Sorry, not just oil, fossil fuel licenses, subsidies and investments. Um, <laughs> So our next speaker, I share that now, <laughs> because our next speaker is honestly one of my heroes. I have so much respect for you, Louis. You've really put yourself on the front line, committed yourself 100% to this, trying everything in your power. Please do come up and share your story with us. Hi everybody, I'm Louis, and before you ask, no, I didn't bring any super glue. I was made to promise. Um, you might know me as the guy who locked his neck to the goalposts, starting the Just Up Oil campaign, the, up until recently, the longest serving climate prisoner in the country. I've done eight and a half months. The guy who went to prison for Interstate Britain. The guy who smashed up petrol stations, glued to Van Gogh paintings, ran on the Formula One track. Um, why I'm here today is to say it's not fair that this is on the youth to deal with. I have... I have recognised that I'm more terrified of the genocide of my entire generation than I am anything the state can do to me. When I was invited here, I was told not to say anything controversial or rude. Now, I do know the, the panic in your face when I say that. Um, but the fact is, controversial is what got us Insulate Britain's demands met. Con controversial is what got Just Up Oil, two of the biggest banks in the country, committing to no new fossil fuel investment projects. <laughs> and so I recognise that what I might say next could be taken as controversial. My generation are facing absolute genocide. Your children are facing genocide. To do anything but throw yourself, your body, into the gears of the machine creating this genocide is to be complicit in this act of genocide. 
I will not stand by as my entire world burns, as my entire family starves. If you will not throw your gears into the machine, throw your body into the gears of the machine, if you will not stand up for your children's lives, if you will, if you will not be, compl if you will be complicit in the genocide of your children, then I don't know what the fuck you are doing. I'm sorry for swearing. I didn't mean for that to come out. But fear not, because if you, if you are not willing to do it, we will do it for your children. We will do it for everybody. We don't have a choice. You know, at this point, it's, I've heard all day, blah, 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 blah. You know, I've heard a lot of people with their wishy-washy words and their, wouldn't it be nice if we do this by 2050, and let's write a declaration. If that declaration doesn't have predominantly plant-based by 2025 and predominantly um, renewable energy by 2025, you're asking me to sign a suicide pact. I'll have no part in it. I didn't come here today to make friends, and I'm assuming I might make people quite angry with me, but it's time that a lot of you step up or shut up. You know, we don't have a decade, we don't have two decades to fix this. It's, if any of you have been to an Extinction Rebellion talk, we have about a year left to make this real change before irreversible, irreversible collapse is locked in. A year. If, if you're working on a project that's gonna take two years, it is worth nothing to my generation. If you're doing something that's going to take a decade, it is worth nothing to my generation. If you do not throw your body into the gears of the machine now, you are betraying my generation and your children. And I, f I feel that somebody needs to say it because nobody else has. So uh, thank you for listening and sorry for ruining all of your days. <laughs>
Um, so I've been a GP and then uh, set up a business to get people onto electric bikes and then uh, came across local councillors, became a councillor, I've been a cabinet member of the, in the BCP. And that, the knowledge that I've gained from being in there led me, plus inspiring people like Lewis, to, 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 to join the Stop Oil because I have the knowledge now to realise that the government is not going to do this unless people stand in their way. Um, and yes, it took me two years to build up the courage to join to Stop Oil, um, but actually it is full of lovely, lovely, inspirational people, mm. and it fills me with energy every time I get involved. Um, and there's lots of things, roles that you can be involved in if you can't be arrested. Um, so I would thoroughly recommend that anybody attends one of their talks as the first step to meeting people. Um, so you just step on. Thank you. If you could pass the mic down to Claire here in the dress. The last one, I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, I'm afraid mine's a comment as well and a, a deeply personal one. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm Louis' mum. Um, and so obviously I've, I've visited him in prison in a, in a, a number of places and had you said to, that to me a year and a half ago, I'd have been horrified. But actually, I think it goes without saying I'm inordinately proud of my son. There's also an exhortation here. Some of us just aren't brave enough. I'm not brave enough. But for those of us who aren't brave enough, if your child or your parent tells you that they want to do what these people are doing, young and old, encourage them and you will be proud of them. Thank you. And proud we are of all of these panellists today. Thank you so much for being here. My final words, I think, though, is that the government isn't acting. And so this conference today and all the people that have come together and all the groups that are working on the ground to actually make the changes happen are important. And so if you can find your role and you're doing something that is reducing emissions, that is restoring nature, then crack on with it with the urgency that's needed and support those that are taking direct action. And the Alex who did the video tasked you all with thinking about something that makes you feel hopeful that could be passed on through schools. So we'll leave it with that little bit of positivity at the end. Jenny. Thank you so much and thank you to all our speakers. I think we've all been very moved by what's been said.